Welcome to Level Up. I'm Alton F. Pettis, and I will be your instructor, facilitator through this course. I want to say a big God bless you to Bishop Carroll and Pastor Muriel Johnson, and for the Life Vision TV family for this opportunity for us to join the family. Thank God that we're going to be able to share the teachings uh, for those that the Lord wants to hear and to increase our walk and our faith in him. The mission of Level Up is to teach, to train, to equip, and to empower the body of Christ to live the abundant, victorious life as we await the imminent return of Jesus Christ. So I ask that you join us as we go through the various courses, as we level up and take on that next level of understanding, knowledge, revelation that the Lord has already in store for us. Oh, and I pray God blesses us. Let's have a word of prayer. And then let's level up. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. It's a day that you saw coming in time eternal. And I thank you that, that we've walked into it now. We've walked into it. This time was not new to you, God. It was nothing strange. Thank you for preordaining it. And I thank you for giving us an obedient heart. I thank you for giving... Bishop Carroll and Pastor Muriel, I thank you for giving them the vision and for their obedience to that vision, God, that the word of God can go forth throughout all the world. Now I ask that you bless as only you can. Give us that soft heart to receive. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. Our first course that we're going to look at is the 41st parable. And it's based on the book, The Parable of the Cockroach, <laughs> written by yours truly. Most of us have some knowledge of cockroaches. And believe me, uh, it was the Lord that directed me, really, to write this particular book. And I trust and pray that something is said, something is read that will help you in your walk or someone you know in their walk with the Lord. With that, let's, let's go ahead and get started. What is a parable? What is a parable? The word parable is from the root word parabola or in the Greek parabole. This compound word comes from para, which means to come alongside or compare, come alongside or compare, and balo, which literally means to throw or to see. To come alongside or compare and literally means to throw or to see with. The parables are used in giving one or more instructional lessons or principles, instructional lessons or principles, and can be used as an allegory and may include inanimate objects like trees, plants, things, or people in various societal positions. It's not only for the average man. Parables were, were for those that were in seats of government. Parables were for the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Parables were, were spoken to everyone. Scripture records three types of parables. There are the parables about the coming of the kingdom of God. And for that, the example is the parable of the 10 versions or the bridegroom found in 
Matthew 25, 1 through 13. This parable speaks to the bridegroom coming and the virgins having oil in their lamps, five of which scripture says were wise and five were foolish. The five that were wise bought enough extra oil in case the bridegroom was late in arriving. Those that were foolish did not bring extra oil. And the bridegroom was late in quotes. But when the bell, the alarm went out that the bridegroom cometh, those that were wise were able to turn their lamps up because they had the oil. But the foolish had no oil in their lamp. And they were told to go buy oil. In the meantime, the bridegroom comes, the doors are closed, and when the five foolish arrive, they do not and are not allowed entry. The parable about the growth of the kingdom of God, it deals with the mustard seed. The mustard seed in Mark 4, 30 through 34. Jesus takes the mustard seed, one of the smallest seeds there are, and he says that the mustard seed grows into a tree. And the tree becomes so large that birds are able to come and nest in it. And so is the growth of the kingdom of God. Look, look, look at the kingdom since the time of Jesus' life to where we are now, and you can see how exponentially the kingdom has grown. And third, parables are about the values within the kingdom. And the example here is the parable of the Good Samaritan, found in Luke 10, 25 through 37. And this parable speaks of a man who was on his way down to Jerusalem and thieves caught him and they took all of his goods. I believe the scripture says a Levite came, a priest came, and a lawyer came. And all none of the three assisted the man. One actually walked on the other side. One walked on the other. But then comes a Samaritan, someone who through genealogy has no dealings with the Jews, but he offered to help. The application here, of course, is almost obvious, is that none of us ever reach a status where we're too good, we're too important, we're too mighty to be able to help our brothers and our sisters. The next question is, why did Jesus use parables? And, and in this lesson, we'll give four reasons. The first reason is to give his enemies no ground. The religious zealots of that time often waited for Jesus to say something they could use against him. By speaking in parables, Jesus was making it difficult for them to accuse him of saying something illegal or blasphemous. Parables were used in very general, everyday situations to share important lessons without alerting those who were enemies of his ministry. Very general, everyday situation to alert those who were enemies of his ministry. And then number two, it was to enlighten those seeking truth. During the course of his three-year ministry, multitudes flocked to hear Jesus speak. Through parables, 
Jesus could enlighten the heart of those who were sincerely hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Through parables, Jesus was able to, to speak, to minister, to enlighten the hearts of those who were sincerely hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Christ knew that there were those there were those ears that listened intently to learn, and there were other ears that listened only for the sake of accusing him of blasphemy. Not everyone had an open heart to receive the gospel. However, speaking in parables gave those with pure hearts an opportunity to receive the truth. Praise God. And the third reason is to encourage deeper thought and contemplation. Jesus knew not everybody, not everybody easily understood his parables. He knew that these parables were given to evoke deeper thought and contemplation of the lesson being taught. Jesus told parables to intellectually challenge his disciples, get them used to critical, organized thinking, and use practical application of the knowledge being given. It wasn't enough just to hear the word. Jesus was helping them to be doers of the word by challenging them to gain a deeper understanding. And the fourth reason is to intentionally separate the wheat from the chaff. At some point, the disciples wanted to know why the Lord always spoke to them in parables, according to Matthew 13 and 10. In telling parables, Jesus was requiring his listeners to either open their spiritual eyes and ears and be saved, or to shut those eyes and ears and be condemned. Parables required disciples not only to think, but to choose. Parables required the disciples not only to think, but to choose. And, and, and that's that's critical that, that we that we put a pin here that that because oftentimes we hear, <laughs> oftentimes we think but we don't choose. But Jesus says, no, no, no. The reason for this parable is more than you just thinking. It's about you making a choice. The ultimate choice to follow the voice of God and adhere to the lesson within the parable is what ultimately separated the wheat from the chaff. In Jesus' three and a half year ministry, he actually taught, depending on your reference, 40 parables. And in this course, in each uh, lesson, we will look at 10 of them. Some will mention others, we won't go into depth, but what we have included is in which of the, th the three gospels you can locate the parable. The first two being the new cloth and the old coat. The second being the new wine and the old wine skin, where Jesus makes a comparison of an old coat. And here you put on a new patch and it, it may work, but it's out of place. And with the new wine in the old wine skins, 
The new wine is placed in the old wineskins, but the old wineskins cannot handle the acidity of the wine and the wineskin bursts. We have the parable of the foolish builders who built their house on the sand. When the wind came and the rain came, their house was blown away. But the wise builder built his on a firm foundation. And so the question becomes, what type of foundation are you building on? He speaks to this one here. The rich man foolishly builds bigger barn. The Lord blesses this rich man to produce and to harvest. And the harvest was so great, he didn't have enough room for all of his gatherings. And so instead of sharing it with those in need, he said, I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns. The angel of the Lord comes to him that night and he calls him a fool. He says, thy fool, this night, shall your soul be required of thee, and then who shall have your spoils? He speaks to the parable of servants that must remain watchful, the wise and the foolish servants, the unfruitful fig tree, which Jesus came upon after three years, and it had no fruit. One of the characteristics about a fruit tree, a fig tree, is that it produces fruit before it produces leaves. And Jesus comes to this fig tree in the parable and there are leaves only. And he says, cut the tree down because it is unfruitful. And then the last one of the 10 is the sower and the four types of soil fell by the wayside. Some seed fell in the rocks, some seed fell in the thorns, and then some seed fell on good ground. And in the parable, Jesus speaks to what happens to the seed in each one. The main takeaway is that we have to remember that the seed is the word of God. And there is nothing wrong with the seed. Let's continue. So the objective of this course is to shine the light of truth on the infestation of sin within the church. The parable of the cockroach was written to encourage personal and collective accountability within the body of Christ while highlighting the biblical tools we have permanently, we have to permanently exterminate sin from our lives. I think I need to say that again. The objective of this course is to shine the light of truth on the infestation of sin within the church. The parable of the cockroach, included in this 41st parable, was written to encourage personal and collective accountability within the body of Christ while highlighting the biblical tools we have to permanently exterminate sin from our lives. So let's just look at the origin of the cockroach. Let's just, let's talk about the cockroach for a minute. Where exactly did cockroaches come from? How have they survived millions Scientist tells us 
that they are part of the Carboniferous period. They have evolved over the years to the shape and characteristics we see now. Cockroaches could be as much as 350 million years old. Scientists aren't sure of their exact origins, but the earliest cockroach fossils date back 235 million years ago, 95 million years earlier than first thought. The order Blatlotia that cockroaches are a part of also includes termites. Interesting, the earliest cockroach are ancestors of manatees and modern cockroaches. As a, a believer of faith, and, and I have to make the caveat here, as a believer of faith, I, I have included cockroaches somewhere in God's Genesis creation and Genesis 125 thereabouts where God replenishes the earth. So how does cockroaches relate to sin? Similar to the cockroach, sin has been around for some time and increases with each passing day. The book of Genesis not only details the beauty of creation, but it also chronicles the fall of humanity and the consequences of sin. Beginning in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned in disobedience to the Lord resulting in the fall of humanity. In Genesis 4, we find the first murder in the Bible where Cain kills his brother Abel. In Genesis 6, we see where the Lord saw the great wickedness of man in the earth. Their hearts were filled with nothing but evil all the time. And then in Genesis 7, 6 again, God regrets that he created man and he made the decision to destroy everything on the earth. Genesis is the first book in the Bible and by the sixth chapter, the first book in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And by the time we get to chapter six, God was ready to destroy the earth because he had had enough of man's humanity's perpetual wickedness. The depravity, sinful, and ungodly lifestyle of the entire world at that time were enough to cause God to regret that he had made man. So if we fast forward today, if we fast forward from the sixth chapter of Genesis to today, we see that the body of Christ has learned to tolerate what God hates, and that's sin. As with cockroaches, sin comes in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Sin can be as seemingly harmless as delayed obedience, fear, or gossip. It can also be as serious as violence or murder. 
as followers of Christ, we must remember there are no levels to sin. God despises them all, and so should we. God despises them all, and so should we. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination unto him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evils, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among the brothers. Proverbs 6 and 16. And you see, I kept right on eating. In the book, in the, in the book, The Parable of the Cockroach, this is really, this is this, this one sentence right here is what really touched my spirit. We were discussing cockroaches, surprisingly. And one of the brothers, we were at breakfast. One of the brothers said, you see, I kept right on eating. How many of us have kept right on eating? Let's continue. We're going to look at four cockroaches during this course. The first cockroach is the American cockroach. And they're the largest cockroach commonly found in homes. Adults can throw, grow up to 53 millimeters, two inches in length. American cockroaches are reddish brown to brown in color with light yellow bands around the shield behind the head. Eating is a full-time activity for an American cockroach. When living outdoors, they tend to eat fungi, wood particles, delay, decaying leaves, algae, and other insects when they're outdoors. But inside, all bets are off. They will eat just about anything, including meats, grease, peanuts, sweets, paper, book bindings, cosmetics, leather, cloth, hair, wallpaper paste, pet food, dead insects, including their own kin, and food crumbs of any kind. Full-time activity. They're an eating machine. Similar to the American cockroach, are all bets off when we are inside and no one can see or hear us? Do we feel comfortable in our sin so long as it can remain hidden? Has our appetite reached down so low that we will eat anything? Are we so greedy that we suffer from the sin of gluttony? Do we ever get enough? Philippians 3.19 said it like this. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind 
earthly things. Yes, Lord. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. Philippians 3.19. And you see, I kept right on eating. Christ is coming back for a bride without a spot or a blemish. We cannot afford to keep eating when there are cockroaches, sin, in the midst. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. The parable of the bride, the ten virgins. But we don't know when the bridegroom is coming. We don't know. We don't know when the call is going out. So we can't afford to keep eating. So questions to ponder. What spiritual sins are we tolerating in our life on today? What makes the sin tolerable for us? And why aren't we disgusted by it? Hmm. Roaches typically run for cover when the lights come on. At some point in my life, uh, as you will read once you're reading uh, the book, uh, I was in pest control. I actually started by owning a pest control company. And so I learned a few things about roaches. But you don't need to have a pest control company to know that if there is a roach infestation of any kind, normally when you cut the light on, the roaches run for cover. The Bible is a powerful tool that we can use to shine the light and exterminate the hidden sin in our lives. All sin is rooted in deception and the word of God provides the light of truth needed to drive out darkness. What happened in the garden? Deception. Satan deceived Eve. Eve, in turn, gave it to her husband, and he did eat. And what makes it worse <laughs> is then Adam tried to blame God for it. The woman you gave me, the woman, yeah, yeah, read it, read it again, read it again. The woman you gave me, she's the one that it. All sin is rooted in deception, and the word of God provides the light of truth needed to drive out darkness. Hebrews 4 and 12 says it like this, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The exterminator is the word of God. And so what does the Bible say about sin? One of the things is that the grace of God should not be intentionally misused. And, and let me just share scripture because I we, we don't want to get in debates. And, and let's just see what the word, what the exterminator says about it. He says, so whosoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin, James 4.17.
what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 1 and 2. And then there are eternal consequences to sin. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth Fourth death, James 1, 15. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death, Revelations 21 and 80. The wages of sin is eternal death, Romans 6 and 23. But what else does the Bible say about it? The Bible says no one is perfect. All have sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The Bible says that Christ is our advocate, my little children, mm, my glory. These things, teach not preach, write I unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. First John 2 and 1. And then finally, that forgiveness is available. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 and 9. And so the choice is yours. We can exterminate the cockroach, the sin with the word of God. And if we sin, we have an advocate. We can come back to God and he will abundantly pardon. God bless you. God bless you. I pray that something's been said. I ask that you share this teaching. Share it with friends, with families those that you know. And if you would like to purchase a copy of the Parable of the Cockroach today, you can find it on Amazon and Kindle, or you can write me at afpettis2 at aol.com or anointedpresspublishing.com. Let me give you those choices again. You can purchase a copy, the Parable of the Cockroach, on Amazon, Kindle, AF Pettis2 at AOL.com or Anointed Press Publishing.com. The cost of the text is $15 plus uh, postage and handling. God bless you. And if you would like to make an online donation, you can use Cash App. And that should say 12, dollar sign, LCOM 1212, PayPal, Evening Light Church of Christ, or Givelify.com, Evening Light Church of Christ. Post office box, if you want to mail it, post office box 4854, Upper Marlboro, 
Maryland 20775. Let me go over this again. If you're doing Cash App, it's dollar sign E L C O M 1 2. Evening Light Christian Outreach Ministry 1 2. PayPal or givelify.com. Evening Light Church of Christ. And on behalf of my wife, Doretha, and myself, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your homes, your workplaces, or wherever you are to share this message, this first of five in this series on the 41st parable. Be blessed of the Lord. Lord God, now we thank you. Uh, we thank you, God, for every door you open. We thank you because you said your word will not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that for which you sent it. And so we 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 take peace, we take calm, knowing that your word, knowing that your word will do what you sent it for. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God and God bless you until the next time. Thank you.